Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Wednesday night sunlight service this week. This is the sun part four. And for the last couple of weeks, we've really kind of been focusing on the fact that Jesus was the son of man, along with being the son of God, how he was born to a woman, how he was born uh, just as we are born. So, uh, uh, again, the scripture says, born under the law to redeem those that were under the law, how he totally identified with us so that we could then totally identify with him. But starting this week, we're going to shift focus a little bit, and we're going to start to kind of look at some of the aspects of what it means to be a son. And not just a son, but the son of God. Because as important as it is that Jesus was 100% man, he was the son of man, it's so important to understand that he was also 100% God, that he is the son of God. And, and again, you know, this all wraps around back to us because as he is, so are we in this world. So if he's the Son of God, and then if we are in him because he is in us, that makes us the Son of God, that makes everything that's true for him true for us. So we're going to start tonight, and really kind of my main passage is in Galatians chapter 3, and then also in chapter 4. I want to start in Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, and in the King James it reads like this, Galatians 3, 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. See, people have this idea where the law is kind of the be-all, end-all, and, and if you follow the law, then you're being a quote-unquote good Christian. But I've always had a problem with that term, good Christian, because to me, you're either a Christian, or, or a believer, or Jesus, or you're not. I don't think there's varying degrees of this thing. And, and listen, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying we don't stumble. I'm not saying things like that. I'm saying, you know, this is a journey and we are coming into the knowledge of who we are by coming into the knowledge of who he is. So there's, you know, there's a maturity, there's a process, there's a growth involved. But I don't think it has anything to do with, you know, being a good Christian or a bad Christian. I don't think those terms apply in the way that we usually think about them. And again, I think, you know, there's this idea where we think a, a good Christian is one who keeps the law. But the law was not given with the intention of us keeping it. Because if you have to keep the law in order to earn something, you're not a son, you're a servant. Okay, and, and, and listen, while, while Jesus, the son who we now are, while he had a servant's heart, he was not a servant in the sense of he had to earn anything. And again, that's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, you had to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. You had to perform in order to be rewarded or, or in order to escape punishment, as it were. But in the New Covenant, we are not servants, we are sons. And a son, as we're going to really kind of see today, and then I think also next week, a son does not have to earn anything from his father, because as we're about to read here in Galatians, if you're a son, then you're an heir. Okay, and, and, and if you're an heir, you don't earn an inheritance. An inheritance is passed down from the father to the son, not because of what the son does, but because of who the son is. And really, more because of who the father is, because it's the father that's doing the, the handing down or the passing down of the inheritance. So see, what we saw here in Galatians is, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Our, our, the law was given to show that we couldn't keep it. The law was given to show that as hard as we tried to perform, there was always, as Jesus said, there was always one thing we lacked. We could never quite grab the brass ring. We could never quite get to the perfection that the law demanded because the law was unable to produce that perfection in us. Our perfection does not come by what we do. Our perfection comes from the perfect one living in us. Our perfection comes not from what we do, but from who we are. And then again it says... Uh, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. We're not justified by our actions. We're not judged by our actions. That's again why we did that whole uh, sermon series about Judgment Day and about how the righteous judgment was handed down from the Father to the Son. And now we don't even have to judge these days. Now we just execute that judgment. We're not justified by what we do. We're justified by what we believe. We're justified by our faith. We're justified by who we are. Because what we do flows from who we are. See, you don't become whoever you are by what you do. You do whatever you do because of who you are. 
And I think many times we get that backwards where we're so focused on what we're doing rather than focusing on who we are. And again, we focus on who we are by focusing on who He is. And, then, and that's exactly what it says in verse 25 of Galatians 3. It says, But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Okay, the law served its purpose. The only way to use the law lawfully is to use it to bring people to Christ. And then once you bring people to Christ, you don't need the law anymore. That's why another place, uh, I believe it was Paul who wrote, We are not under the law, but we're under grace. We've moved out of the old covenant and into the new covenant. A, 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 a whole transformation has taken place where we're not servants any longer, but now we know that we are sons, or, 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 you know, in my theology, capital S, we know we are the Son of God. And that's what verse 26 says, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. When we have faith in Him, our true identity, that's when our true identity manifests in us, and that's how we be transformed into what we've already been transformed into by the renewing of our mind. Not by the carnal mind, not by the unregenerated mind, not by the mind that's connected to the law where, where, you know, to the natural mind, do good and be rewarded, do bad and be punished makes perfect sense. An eye for an eye makes perfect sense. The law makes sense to the carnal mind. And that's why God gave it to the people before the cross who were not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because it's what they wanted. Because it's what they knew. It, because it's what, they, it's what made sense to them. But there's a more excellent way. And his name is Jesus, and his covenant is the new covenant, where our sins and iniquities are remembered no more, where God's law, or, or, or again the new commandment, love one another as Jesus loves you, is not written on tablets of stone, but it's written on our hearts. It comes from the inside out, instead of being you know external and trying to force its way in. And then verse 27 it says, For as many of, of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So now all of a sudden it even takes it back all the way to Abraham, and it says what God promised Abraham and his seed is now our inheritance. We are now heirs. And again, that's one of the major aspects of what it means to be a son or, or the son is, is to be an heir, is to be in line for the inheritance. What God promised to, to, to again, to Abraham, to David, to all of the, the fathers and the patriarchs, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, all of those people, what he promised to Jesus, he has given to us, he has fulfilled in Jesus. So let's read this in the Message Bible and then we'll go on to Galatians chapter 4. In the Message Bible, Galatians 3, starting with verse, with verse 23, reads, Until the time when we were mature enough to respond freely in faith to the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic Law. The law was like those Greek tutors, with which you are familiar, who escort children to school and protect them from danger or distraction, making sure the children will really get to the place they set out for. But now you have arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ, you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs according to the covenant promises. And then on into verse, or, uh, Galatians chapter 4, I'll continue it in the message and then I'll go back to the King James. In the message, Galatians 4, starting with verse 1, continues on and says, Let me show you the implications of this. As long as the heir is a minor, he has no advantage over the slave. Though legally he owns the entire inheritance, he is subject to tutors and administrators until whatever date the father has set for emancipation. That is the way it is with us. When we were minors, we were just like slaves, ordered around by simple instructions. 
the tutors and administrators of this world, with no say in the conduct of our own lives. But when the time arrived that was set by God the Father, God sent His Son, born among us of a woman, born under the conditions of the law, so that He might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. And I think that's an interesting phrase, kidnapped by the law. Because we seem to think that God's original plan A was the law, but it wasn't. God's original plan A was walking with Adam in the cool of the evening in the garden and speaking to him and having a relationship with him. Religion was not God's plan. Religion is what man built and what man wanted. We were kidnapped by the law. We were kidnapped by this, uh, really by this identity theft that was put upon us when the serpent hissed in Eve's ear and said, you have to do something in order to be like God. Because that's a lie, and really that's, that's the biggest lie that's ever been told. We do not have to do in order to be. We do because we be. Okay? Everything we do flows from our, our identity. We're not earning our identity. Okay? You are who you are. You know, like Popeye says, I am what I am. And, and I found that, that I can't be anybody else. As hard as I try to be somebody else, at the end of the day, when I look in the mirror, I can only be me. So the key, again, is to look in the mirror with an unveiled face, to see Jesus in the mirror, to see my true self in the mirror, my true identity in the mirror, to be changed into that same image of the glory of God from glory to glory. See, if our life is hidden in Christ, if you want to find your life, you have to look for it in the right place. And, and really, the looking for it, 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 it's not us searching it out, it's Him revealing it to us. And, and see, he, 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 he rescued us from the law that had kidnapped us. He, he got us out of the bondage that we were in. He, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and He brought us out of death and into life. He, that's what salvation is. He saved us from our sins. He saved us from unbelief. He saved us from the violence of human effort, and He saved us literally from ourselves, from our old man, carnal beast nature. And He saved us from that carnal beast nature by giving us His love nature. And again, that's what it means to be conformed into His image. That's what it means to be transformed. And, and that all happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. So now we manifest that transformation. Now we walk in that transformation. Now we experience and enjoy that transformation by the renewing of our mind. By letting Him live His life through us instead of trying to live uh, uh, up, to a, uh, up to an impossible standard that could never be measured up to. So He says... Uh, Thus, we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. You can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as His own children because God sent the Spirit of His Son into our lives, crying out, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave, but a child? And if you are a child, you're also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. Okay, our inheritance is not in our future. Our inheritance is here and now. We have already been given our inheritance. And I think we're really going to dig into this in, in, coming up later. But, but the bottom line is, uh, the Bible, I think it's in Hebrews, it talks about how, you know, uh, uh, a testament or, or a will is no good if the testator is alive. But when he dies, then, it, it, you know, the, the inheritance is given out. And that's one of the aspects of why Jesus died on the cross. He died so that we could get everything that we had coming to us, which again is Him, and, and we're going to look at that for the rest of the, the service tonight. Our inheritance is Jesus. He died so that we could have a death, and He rose back up so that we could have His life. And that's what He gave us. And, and again, that's what our inheritance is, and that's what we have full access to right now. So let's look at this in the King James, and then we're going to really kind of dig in a little bit into uh, uh, just what exactly the inheritance is all about. So Galatians chapter 4, starting with verse 1, in the King James it reads, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. So again, we're starting to talk about maturity. We're starting to talk about growing up in the knowledge of Jesus. We're starting to, we're talking about starting to, to really understand who we are, where we are, why we're here, what we have, all of these glorious things that, that everybody's still waiting for that, that have already been given to us. We have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly Christ. We have already been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. 
There's nothing you need that you don't already have because you already have Jesus. And that's all we ever need. Really, that's our heart's desire. That's all we've ever wanted was to be loved. And, and again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about an heir being one of the biggest aspects of being a son. But the number one biggest aspect of being a son is being loved by the Father. It's being in a relationship with, with, a, with, with a daddy who, who unconditionally loves you. That's as simply as I can make it. That's what it means to be a son, is to have a father who loves you. And again, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not disregarding a mother, and I'm not doing any of those things. So I'm just showing the picture that Jesus showed a father and a son, and an and unconditional, intimate love relationship between a father and a son. That's what he showed us when he showed us the father. So verse 2 goes on and says, uh, he, he differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. The time appointed of the Father was the cross. Two thousand years ago, on an old rugged cross, on a hill in Calvary, the, the Father's appointed time came to pass. Okay, everything that was in type and shadow came into full manifestation on the cross. Because everything that was in type and shadow, everything the prophets were looking forward to, was Jesus. So when he came and finished the work, that was the appointed time. That was when we got it all, because he did it all, and he gave it all. He gave himself to us. So verse 3 says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. See, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. And he wasn't saying, you know, he, he, people had access to God before Jesus came, you know, mainly through the prophets. But then when Jesus came, he wasn't talking about access to some distant God. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. He said, you can't experience this relationship of a father and a son unless you come through the son, unless the son comes into you. He said, if you want this relationship, there's only one way to have it. You can only have a father-son relationship with the father by being the son. And that's what this Holy Spirit does. It, 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 it allows us, it equips and empowers us to cry out, Abba, Father. It equips and empowers us to know him as our father. It equips and empowers us to, to get out of religion and into relationship. And then verse 7 it says, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And that word heir is number 2818 in Strong's Greek Concordance. And it means getting by apportionment, a sharer by lot, an inheritor or a possessor. Okay, and when I read the, the, the definition for that word, it, it absolutely clicked in my brain just exactly what our inheritance is. And then I found uh, a couple of verses to really back it up. But bottom line, our inheritance, the same inheritance that was promised to Abraham, who we are his seed, who we are heirs to that promise, was the promised land. That's what was given by apportionment to the people of Israel. That's what they shared in by lot. That's what they possessed. The promised land. And again, in the New Covenant, we understand that it's not a piece of real estate, but it's the rest of God. It's being able to enjoy the finished work instead of always having to try to finish the work. The work is finished. Jesus did it all so we could get it all. And now that he's done it all, and now that we've got it all, now we can stop trying to make something happen, and we can start to enjoy the fruit of his labor. And uh, so, uh, I found some, again, I found some verses to back this up. The first one is Joshua chapter 11, verse 23. Joshua eleven twenty three, In the King James it reads, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by the tribes. And the land rested from war. Once you get your inheritance, you can stop trying to earn your inheritance. Once you understand, and, and again, it's a possessor. It's not about just saying, well, I'm going to get to the promised land someday. No, it's about possessing the promised land today. 
It's about knowing that we don't have to get anywhere because we're already where we need to be. Okay? That's why I wrote the book Six Steps to the Throne to try to show us that the six steps that get us to the throne were taken by Jesus. And he did it for us and as us, so in a sense we've already done it. We've already arrived. You don't have to try to get somewhere when you already know where you're at. And, and again, the best part about this verse is when it says, And the land rested from war. The promised land is rest. It's rest from war. It's rest from strife. It's rest from struggling. It's rest from, from really from, from living in, in a state of spiritual death. It's rest from trying to, you know, Jesus said, up until John the Baptist, the kingdom suffered violence and the violent took it by force. Up until. And then things changed. And then when Jesus arrived, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, I'm here to give you what you've been trying to fight your way towards, but you could never earn on your own. I'm here to give it to you. Because you're not a servant who has to earn something, but you're a son who is in position to receive something. You're a son who is in a position to possess something. So the land has rest, because the land is rest. Now Psalm 16, 5 says it like this, and I really like this verse in Psalm 16. It says, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. So, so what is our inheritance in a word? It's Jesus. What is our inheritance in a word? It's rest. What is our inheritance in a word? It's love. That's what the Father gave to the Son. And, and again, since we are the Son, that is what our Father gave to us. Uh, that's why uh, Jesus said in another place, he said, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He didn't say, try real hard and earn the kingdom. He said, here it is, I'm giving it to you. He says, I am your inheritance, and I'm here so that you can have your inheritance, so that you can enjoy your inheritance. I'm here that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And, and, an, and a, an abundant life is simply a life filled with love. That's what resurrection life is all about. That's what Jesus' life is all about. To live is to love, and to love is to live. Okay, so if you want to try to live Jesus' life, if you want to try to earn love from people, you can't do it. But, if you follow the new commandment, love one another as he loves you, then the focus is off of you and what you're doing, and the focus is on him and what he has done. It's off of how much you can love somebody else, and it's on how much he loves you. And when you know how much he loves you, then you become filled with that love, and then that love just flows out of, uh, uh, out of your belly like, like a river of living water. He is our inheritance. He is the portion of our cup. He is what satisfies us and what fills us up. And he says, Thou maintainest my lot. So the lot we've been given, the inheritance we've been given, the promised land we've been given, it's not our job to dress it and keep it, like it was Adam's job way back in the Garden of Eden. He is the gardener, and we are the garden. Okay, he is the one who, who, who trimmed back the bushes. He's the one who cast all the trees, you know, that didn't produce good fruit. He cast them into the fire, which is God. He did all the work that needed to be done. He conformed us into his image on the cross. He maintains our lot. He keeps us where we need to be. He keeps us from falling. He does it all in us and through us and as us. So again, if you're, if you're stuck looking at what you're doing or not doing, if you're stuck looking at what you've done or haven't done, you need to get your eyes off of things on the earth and you need to set your affections on things above. Okay? Because, and as we're just about to see in a second, it's about heaven. This is what we're talking about. This is the new mind. This is the promised land. Our inheritance is heaven. And that's what First Peter... Chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 says, and then I have one more verse in Deuteronomy, and then I'm going to close for tonight. I just really, again, I want to make this short and sweet. I want to make this really accessible. I just want to really focus on we are sons, which means we are heirs, which means we have the inheritance, which is the promised land. So 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, it reads in the King James, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled 
and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Remember that phrase, reserved in heaven for you. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, let me read it in the Message Bible, and then we're going to link it with a verse in Deuteronomy, and then I'm going to close. 1 Peter 1, 3-5, and the message reads, What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have Him, this Father of our Master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. Okay, it's not heaven somewhere that we're going to get to someday. It's heaven right here and right now. The future starts now. A new life starts now. Listen, everlasting life does not start when you die. Everlasting life is everlasting. It's always been and it will always be. It's like, you know, it's like the, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek. It's like King Melchizedek who had uh, no beginning of life and no end of days. He just simply always was. It's like Jesus being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's never a time that there wasn't everlasting life. It doesn't start when you die. Okay, when you, when you die, if you die, when you pass through uh, the, the gates of death, that's just a different form of what we're talking about. That's just a, a, a different dimension of what we're talking about. Everlasting life starts when you jump into the river of life. It starts with that baptism. It starts with entering into that covenant. It starts with believing. And again, we're going to look at that in Hebrews about how some people missed out on the rest of God. Some people missed out on the promised land through unbelief. Okay, but if you know about this, this inheritance, then you can believe it. Then you can receive it. He says the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all. Life healed and whole. Now I want to link this up, and this is where I want to close, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 21. And just so we're absolutely clear about what we're talking about, how it, it's not heaven somewhere in our future. Okay, when Jesus was standing on the earth, he referred to himself as the Son of Man who is in heaven. Okay, and the reason that he was in heaven when he was standing on the earth is because heaven was in him. And that's the same way it is with us. We're in the kingdom because the kingdom's in us. We're in heaven because heaven's in us. This was God's promise. This was part of God's promise in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Verse 21 says, That your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them. Again, the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic inheritance, that, if, that, that we, because we are sons, we are heirs of this promise. He says, as the days of heaven upon the earth. That's here now. That's not, we don't get our inheritance someday. We have our inheritance now. We don't get to heaven someday. We are in heaven now. And again, I'm not taking away a dimension of heaven for after your, after your body dies, if your body dies. I'm not taking that away. I'm just saying there's something available to us right now. We can have the days of heaven upon the earth. We can stand on the earth and we can be in heaven the same way that Jesus was. Okay? Because again, as he is, so are we in this world. Because again, our life is hid in him. So, so anything that has to do with us, we have to find it in him. If it's true for Jesus, it's true for me. And it's true for you. This is what the inheritance is. It's, it's the promised land of rest. It's the days of heaven upon the earth. It's a life, but an abundant life an everlasting life, an eternal life. It's a resurrection life. It's a life filled with love as the Father unconditionally loves the Son and really just fills us with His love through the Spirit, our love receptor, that allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. That allows us to say, Yeah, Daddy, I know you love me. That allows us to be who we are today rather than trying and trying and trying to be somebody that we're not. God doesn't want you to be anybody else. He made you you. And He made you specifically you for a specific purpose. He wants you to be who you are. He wants you to touch the people that you can reach. And if we're trying to be somebody else, we might miss that. If we're trying to live someone else's life, we'll miss living our own life. And that's why we're here. We were given life to live. And again, the difference between death and life is love. Jesus said, and then, and then uh, John the Revelator picked up on it, that we have passed from death to life 
The way that we know that is that we love the brethren, that we love one another. That's what our inheritance is about. It's about we don't have to earn love, we can rest in His love. That's our inheritance, that's what we have right now. And that's what I have for this week. Thank you, I love you, amen.